Hello. The Chartered Institute of Securities and Investment, as part of their CPD sessions, recently extended me an invitation to present on cryptocurrency and digital assets in a regulated world. I began by asking the CISI members present to focus on this word, regulated world. Within an economy, there exist multiple regulated sectors, be it telecommunications to healthcare and financial services. Within financial services is one of the more stringently regulated sectors. Regulations within financial services exist to define the role of market participants and to ensure systemic and process integrity so that bad actors and bad acts do not go on to impinge on the wider economy. The contents of the event follows. Today, when I focus on uh, cryptocurrency and digital assets within this domain, that is financial services, what I want, uh, I would be mostly focusing on payments, securities related aspects, because digital assets tends to fit in more or rather interact more with that side of regulations. And that's my focus. Given that fact, I also like to uh, highlight that this is a nascent industry. It's one of those things which is upcoming. Um, so regulators are still trying to find their feet in more ways than one. Uh, market participants or players as well are discovering different things. So, you know, it's a, it's a question about pushing the envelope sometimes. So I'm sure some of you here would have a better understanding on some of the things we might discuss or examples and stuff. So please feel free to uh, let me know, correct me if I am uh, wrong sometimes. And, uh, I'm open for interactions as well, so anytime just you know, hit me up and let's talk it further. Um, okay, within financial services, if you look at the landscape, we have multiple market participants. We're all from the industry, so let me not go too in deep, but the key purpose of this slide here is for me to highlight that each of these regulated players have a responsibility and a role to ensure that the system integrity or the process integrity is preserved. And when we look at cryptocurrencies and digital assets within a regulated world, what we need to look at is, are these, is, is, is this asset class or are these asset classes um, trying to change some of the existing processes. And if they are trying to change the existing processes, do you, in that phase, are they going to dislodge some of the market participants? So the incumbents. As we all know, since 2017, 18, or if you have been within the crypto world, as it's called, uh, much earlier, you would have sensed there was a lot of media uh, headlines when Bitcoin, the most the big daddy or the granddaddy of cryptocurrencies, um, had a rise up to 20,000 in, in Jan of 2018. A lot of media hype. And then subsequent crash down up to 3,000, even more hype at the bottom. You know, Bitcoin was dead at 3,000. Today we are back up at 10,000 a, a, a coin. And um, again, so that's, you know, the, the media has always only focused on the cryptocurrency side, the price of a digital coin. But what's not been covered, or in my personal view, has not been adequately covered, is that the underlying ecosystem that has got built since 2013, within this industry and what kind of impact that's going to have within financial services be it if you are a payment operator or a bank a conventional commercial bank or an investment company and exploring this uh, is my key focus for the day normally people the, the common criticism you've heard about blockchain is that is blockchain a solution going in search of a problem or is or do we need a solution to to um, a problem that's needed and today within our, in my uh, focus what I want to make sure is that blockchain is not a solution for everything within financial services 
it's not one thing that's going to solve everything where you know disparity of income is going to be reduced the unbanked 2 billion unbanked population suddenly are going to become banked simply because we have this blockchain technology none of that um, I thought this was going to take a bit more but anyway let me finish this uh, but instead the the impact or the effect of the technology is in its ability to transform key facets of financial services and that's what I'm going to focus on uh, which is regulated market participants exist to validate validate the processes and provide trust and regulatory comfort to any of the acts which takes place. So be it within your payments, your banking services, so on and so forth. Now let's bring in tech to this mix. What is the ability of tech? Tech has the ability to improve efficiency, simplify processes, reduce cost, enhance user experience and so forth. And this at its core, it is, it's, it, it, it's the it's ability to make paradigm shifts. And before I go into blockchain or digital assets or cryptocurrencies and bring them back to financial services, let's look at financial services historically and how it has reacted to or embraced new innovations coming in. Let's look at card payments. Um, 1999 somewhere on there. How did you make your card payment? Go to a supermarket, pay it, cluck, cluck, the imprint machine, a carbon copy, pink copy, so cluck, cluck, sign, then it was swipe, sign, then it was uh, chip, yeah, chip and sign, then chip and pin, now tap, and now NFC, any NFC enabled device, cardless, which can emulate my card signature, tap, payment done. Right, so this kind of innovation, when it comes to financial services, what does it do? It improves the process. Like, I mean, let's look at only that front end of that payment process. It improves the process. It makes it faster. It improves the user, uh, user um, uh, comfort levels of using, security, so on and so forth. There is no resistance here. Why? Because the incumbent market players, be it banks, payment services, no one's come to eat their lunch. Someone's come to help them make it better, right? The regulators, no problem at all, because they're not worried about a technology or an uh, a technology which has come to improve efficiency. So for a regulator as well to embrace that technology is not a big deal. It's he doesn't have to make any changes. So when an innovation like that hits financial services, it's accepted, it's swiftly embraced, and bang, you have it. Let's look at another example, M-Pesa. Uh, anyone familiar with M-Pesa? Safaricom? Okay, so M-Pesa is, uh, is dominant in East Africa at the moment. It's basically where Safaricom took on phone credits, converted into a wallet-based system where people were able to pay their bills, utilities, you name it, do trade and everything just by transferring phone credit. The key thing there was the Kenyan Central Bank um, appreciated the initiatives of Safaricom. Of course, I'm speaking from a third party level uh, as um, in a few years, I'm sure Safaricom t 10 years ago would have been complaining about the regulator, but it's okay. But, you know, from a Kenyan central bank point of view, they embraced the technology, they made some modification to accept payment and, re payment and receipt of cash through this, and bang, now M-Pesa dominates East Africa. And it's a case study in terms of its success. Um, let's look at Let's look at WeChat. Chinese, anyone, Chinese giant, anyone familiar with WeChat? These guys process 18.7 trillion US dollars in 2018, much larger than Visa and MasterCard put together. This was just a chatting, an app, a chat app like WhatsApp. Okay, and they grew 
uh, and then they expanded to include different services. Now, today, WeChat, today whilst we are talking about digital disruption in banking, digital banking and so forth, WeChat is in a position to actually implement behavioral banking strategies. Behavioral banking strategies, for example, is like, I know I'm digressing a bit here, but I will uh, bring it back into context down the line. So behavioral banking is when, if you and I go to a bank, we apply for a car loan, both of us get approved. What happens? We both pay the same rate of interest for that car loan. Why? Why should we? Why should I pay the same interest rate as X? My credit profile is very different than X. Maybe I should pay higher, maybe I should pay lower, but it don't matter, it shouldn't be the same because it should be dependent on your own credit profile. So behavioral banking is where a bank would extend you interest rates or your rate of return on your savings relevant to your profile the information they have, the data they have warehoused because they have information about your behavioral patterns, what you like, where you spend, what, what, where, you know, how, how do you operate, Are you, do you pay your bills on time, it adds to your credit score. So WeChat, because of an app came out, Chinese uh, regulations allowed it to grow and WeChat within the app you can order a taxi, you can buy insurance, and today you can even apply for your home mortgage. Right, that's what WeChat has done. Now, why is this relevant for us? Is because a key role that was played here was by the regulators. On one hand, the technology came in, card payments, market embraced this, bang, it slipped in, became part of the ecosystem. Here, regulators understood in the case of M-Pesa, it was because the unbanked populations the, uh, and the banks just wouldn't go down the pyramid to, to serve them. M-Pesa gave them a method to trade and transact and exchange value between each other. In the case of WeChat, um, the Chinese authorities felt that building homegrown tech brands is far more valuable as opposed to letting a foreign player come into their market. So they made sure the regulations were well in place for be it WeChat to Baidu to you name it. There were seven of them, massive giants. And I think the facial recognition technology WeChat has, I don't think they implement it now, but uh, they, they did a beta test in Guangzhou. The entire population of Guangzhou's facial, uh, um, facial identity is available on, on, the, on the system. So I can walk down to the st train station even before I get into a train. The people in the train station will know that I've, I'm in the station, right? Um, I know for some people this might cause privacy or this and that, but I don't know, <laughs> those are personal things. Personally, it doesn't bother me. I really like it. If somebody knows everything about me, and if I can own that information, and if I can monetize it, hey, why not? If it's going to make my life better. But those are different things. You know, privacy is a separate topic altogether. But uh, key, key takeaways from this, one is when regulators embrace and facilitate a technology to grow, the amount it can achieve is far greater than if it has to fight itself in. Another key chat about WeChat, look at the age groups here. You see, this is 2015 and 2017. Look at 18 to 25 and 36 to 50. So now you have the top half of the, the camels back there, right? So when the population moves, that is who are in 18 to 25, move to, move right, for you, the, the, which, you know, this way. Um, moves right, at some point, the curve will look like a flat line, which means any service that you consume would be digital. That's because the guys who are 18 to 25, 26 to 35, who are using WeChat today, are not going to go back to a bank teller to withdraw cash. It's not gonna happen. They're gonna ask for more 
more convenience, more things. So what's going to happen to this curve? Flat line. So you start there, right? That's the transformative impact of digitization or digital technology is having within financial services. And this one is when an existing financial system is not, when you don't rock the boat, when you don't want to, you know, mess the apple cart, innovation is easily accepted. Incumbent market players are very willing to accept you, use you. But when the technology that's coming into the system has the ability to dislodge you, that's when you have resistance. You have resistance from the incumbents, and you will have inertia on the part of the regulator. Inertia on the part of the regulators because, you know, it's the unknown. Their key objective is to protect the consumers, the market participants, the fear of the unknown. So that will create inertia. And in terms of the incumbents, hey, someone's come to, I need to share my lunch, or I might not you know, I'll have to lose my place in this ecosystem. In my personal view, I believe blockchain as a technology, which has enabled the creation of cryptocurrency and digital assets, is one of those technologies which will have a transformative effect on financial services. As we move on, let's find out how. Before that, let's look at what blockchain is multiple definitions, um, and I don't want to get too technical here, but think of it as a cryptographic ledger, where given the fact that it's a tip cryptographic ledger and it is encoded, as a, and encoded and arranged as a database, each of the packet of data cannot be, it becomes immutable because a cryptography is the security which wraps it all up. And to keep things simple, uh, this is my colleague said, no, don't define blockchain, just keep it simple. The people, okay, so that's, that's the second paragraph to keep things simple. For. The, uh, because the ledger in which all the transactions are recorded are kept in multiple places and updated at the same time, right? If one ledger does not match with the other, that transaction does not go through. This is the key aspect or attribute of blockchain, right? Because the, you have multiple ledgers held in multiple places, and when one transaction is not recorded the same way across all, that does not get recorded. And what does this do? It disintermediates trust. So in our previous slides, we looked at multiple market participants within financial services, all of these people or these institutions. And their key role was to preserve the integrity of the system, of the processes. And that's how they gave trust. And that's how they brought in trust to the transaction you did. That's how they brought in comfort for the regulator. If a technology can come and replace that trust by disintermediating it, right, by having a process which can then give you that kind of assurance, right? That you can believe when I get 5 BTC in my wallet, that, hey, it is really 5 BTC. That is not a mirage I'm staring at, right? And when, if a technology can enable that, now this is one of the reasons why we have some resistance when it comes to this technology blending in within the existing financial services regulations. Why? Because it's going to threaten or dislodge certain incumbent market participants. Their roles are going to be modified. And that's not easy for incumbents to accept. Could this not actually create a problem whereby the global financial system as it stands could collapse? Because so much of the global financial system at the moment is predicated on obscure, opaque accounting systems, where there are companies and Okay, so let me let me bifurcate that question for clarity, for sake of clarity. 
So there's two attributes here. One is if all financial transactions are going to be done on a distributed ledger, would this increase transparency and then expose bad actors? One. The second aspect of your question was, would this expose companies or corporates whose financial statements are cooked? And the government. <laughs> the government's financial statements are cooked. Okay, two different things, yeah? One is, and this is why I said earlier, blockchain is not a solution for everything. It is just a process which disintermediates trust. If I, so it's how you're going to use it. When it comes to if government accounts can be in on a public ledger, would that prevent the government or the corporate from cooking the books? It has nothing to do with this technology. Because this technology focuses on transfer of value. Can that process be disintermediated in terms of trust? A. Transfer of assets or ownership. Can that process be disintermediated? Your question is more to do with what happens if you have an Enron or GE now. Uh, yeah, that's, yeah, ask the big four. They should, do their, they should do, be doing a better job. Can you move the financial statements to, to, um, to, the to a blockchain and make it more transparent? No. Um, yeah, that, that would be that would be fascinating to 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 be to do. But no, the the problem is that if I'm going to be on a chain, right? Say, say, um, let's take for example JPM coin, JP Morgan's. Uh, coin which they have issued, which can be used between couple of you know within their closed circuit banks. Now, if I want my financial statements to be on a chain and come live every time a transaction is processed, so you have an updated financial statement real time for any corporate, the entire transactions that that corporate does needs to be within that ecosystem. So I cannot buy apples with cash, but my, buy my coffee, my, I mean pay Starbucks with BTC and then tell my bank my credit score doesn't have the Apple thing, you know what I mean, right? So it, everything needs to be in the same ecosystem. Now to do that is, hey, if someone can do it, great, but um, the feasibility of it is tough. So where you can bring in transparency is more in terms within when people operate within a closed loop or when all are part of that network. Say for example, if everything I pay for is in JPM coin, then you can have my entire transactions captured. But if I have multiple payment channels now, so maybe that's for later on, somebody else needs to come up with something else. That's, I don't know, the next technology for us to wait for, I guess. But um, countries saying they, they have money, but they don't have money, they don't really have it. That's, that's an accounting fraud. So, for another day. Pardon? Yeah, oh, well, it's a topic for another day. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so going back to blockchain. Um, so, as a technology, it exists to disintermediate trust within processes. Simple takeaway. Right, and how does it do it? Because all the ledgers have to be updated at the same time, and if they are not, if one is off, you know, you know, it, it won't get recorded. So you know where's wrong, that's where you go. So as a technology, it's very simple. It's very straightforward. It just makes you do everything at the same time, and you can find out if one is not balancing, it's not going through. Hey, who's, who's, oh, that's there. Pick it up. So it's a very simple technology but it's going to have a profound impact, just like with anything that's simple. Simple things have the most profound impact. That's just a personal statement, but you know, it's one of those things. Um, okay.
there's two things that uh, okay so I've covered one of these points earlier so let me just go through that again one is that the fact that it disintermediate trust it can dislodge existing market participants and that's a problem that the regulated market is having because let's say for example securities clearing how many of you are from shares bonds clearing side of the business or investment companies here okay if when you buy a share right how does it go through let's let's take dfm for example i buy the share okay i go through the broker it goes to the clearing agent gets cleared then the broker settles his broker comes via the clearing agent goes back to the bank right so there's two brokers one clearing agent maybe one or two banks maybe three involved and it's just i bought shares on this exchange straight up here and then there were all these players behind doing everything when i buy the share it comes into my uh I keep saying it wallet now, but I shouldn't. It's in my, my, my broken account immediately, right? But when do I settle? T plus two, T plus three? How many things can happen between today and T plus two? Well, maybe nothing much, maybe a lot. But irrespective of that, if your objective is to minimize systemic risk, then when should the transaction go ahead? then and there here and now right blockchain as a technology when you implement it has that ability simply because of what i was mentioning the, the ledger that needs to get updated at the same time so money and shares have to cross at the same time now why am i why did i bring that example is because trying to give you a a small view into how an existing market participant can get dislodged. If I'm holding a digital asset, I hold it in my wallet. And I want to give it to a custodian, I give it to a custodian who can hold it on my behalf. When I hold my shares, I hold nothing. It's in a depository, so I'm told. Right? And I get a paper statement. Yeah, I believe it. It's there but you don't have it physically you don't have custody over it and similarly when a trade happens and you're going to settle t plus two if one of the market participants don't have their money to settle that transaction would fail and you take that 24 hour 36 hour risk on those transactions right now just imagine a system right where i buy my shares the transaction, transaction settles on the, on the minute, on the second. I get my shares in my wallet. Why do I need the depository? Why do I need the clearing agent? And that's when existing incumbent market players can get dislodged because of a new technology. And they're not going to sit down and take it lightly when you bring this on board. And what I've told you as an example of a stock trading and settlement on the chain, this is not a figment of my imagination. Um, there are institutional infrastructure which is being built exactly for this. And it's, it's probably a matter of time before we all move into that because it makes sense but anyway until that time let's look at the merits of it uh, or some examples of who this so you can go back and check and read about this read about on hyperledger hyperledger was a blockchain which was created by ibm and digital assets and now moved on to linux foundation um, and linux gives it out as an open source software so you can develop on top of it a lot of securities based applications are being built on this um, R3 Coda, a corporate uh, focused chain, um, currently being used in logistics and things like that, but they have a lot of focus within financial services as well, and a lot of exchange backbone is being evaluated on this. Um, and then you have JPM coin was issued on Quorum. Uh, Quorum is um, Ethereum chain forked. Forked means 
take the chain, you decide that henceforth, moving forward on this aspect of the chain, how transactions are going to be recorded. It, you change the algorithm, you change the protocol, you change the method. That's when you fork a chain. So Quorum is a forked Ethereum chain in which the JPM coin is issued on. Um, so one aspect of the blockchain technology is its ability to disintermediate trust and more importantly remove or removes existing market players or disintermediate processes. Another thing is blockchain as a technology is global. Right? It's not something that's focused on one part of the world. Why? Because so these statistics can be a bit not so accurate because it's just not there to have accurate information on this. But roughly speaking, there are apparently more than 50 million BTC wallet or Bitcoin wallets. Um, as of today, there are around 70 million Ethereum wallets. Doesn't mean there are 70 million participants because one person can have more than one wallet. Now, if a person in Shanghai could transfer one BTC, say 10K USD, to someone in San Francisco, right? This transaction goes through without any intermediaries. It goes through without a central bank involved. It goes through without SWIFT. It goes through without banks, right? So you transferred value across continent without intermediaries. Anything you issue on a blockchain, right? Any asset you issue on a blockchain has this ability. It has the ability to be globally transactable. You can transfer value in a disintermediated way, right? Now, that is another problem for the regulators, right? Because traditionally, you sit in your ivory tower, look down at your little kingdom, and hey, everyone's, you know, marching to order. But now what happens? Your kingdom is just borderless, right? How are you going to contain? How would your rules be defined? And that's the conundrum. So this is where, if, if one looks at how this technology is being embraced or accepted within the existing system, and you have a lot of negative headlines and... Uh, um, um, hey, there was a scam in the ICOs. Let's, let's not you know, beat around it. It was true. But it doesn't mean that the underlying technology in itself is not good. Remember, again, digressing a bit, every time a new technology comes into the market, the first people to embrace this technology are the bad actors. Right? If you introduce a technology into a market, and if you find the bad actors not embracing it, hey, your technology ain't no good, right? Because they are always trying to be ahead of the curve, ahead of the, the, the authorities, ahead of the regulators, anyone. This is, this is the role of a bad actor. They, they live to, you know, malafide acts. That, that's how they make their bucks. So if something comes and all the bad actors flock to it, right? It just means that it's really good. It's just ahead of its time. So the regulations haven't caught up to it. Anyway, without going, um, without too much praise to this technology, because it has its faults, it's not a solution to everything, it's yet another technological feature, plus it. Um, okay, so blockchain, broadly, digital ledger, with the security features, its ability to. Another key thing is smart contracts. Uh, okay, let me correct myself. You can do uh, coding or uh, like smart contract kind of things on the Bitcoin blockchain, but it's not easy. It's it's not cost efficient, and uh, it's a, yeah, it's not worth doing it uh, as as for my knowledge. And I'm not a tech guy, but uh, I think so. Let, just qualifying that statement. So Ethereum, it's easy. As a platform, it's built to write smart contracts. What smart contracts do is that it's an embedded code. So for example, if two assets have to go from A to B, you can write in the code or the triggers at which the transaction should happen. 
right? That's a smart contract. So it's basically a, a programming code that you can embed into the asset and the asset has the, has the ability to accept it and then act in accordance. So that's the smart contract. And why this is relevant is Ethereum is not the, in my view, not the preferred chain, again personal view, not the preferred chain for securities transactions. But if you were to do securities transactions on the Ethereum chain, uh, this, the ability of smart contracts is significantly relevant. Why? Because you can KYC wallets. So KYC two wallets, good, both are good now. But suddenly I get uh, A's name flashes up on a sanction list. Okay, so what would, you, what would we do in a conventional world? We will call the client, our compliance will go into you know, activity mode, <laughs> and then make some calls, get the client to explain, and freeze that account. Right, conventional. Now, can you do that with, uh, in, uh, for, on a wallet? Yeah, when you have smart contracts, what you can prevent is the transfer of these assets to bad wallets. Or you can, on the Stellar chain, which I believe is a really good chain to issue securities on, um, I can recall the, I can, can, I can nullify. So if, it, if the security moved from A to B and B got flagged, I can nullify that transaction. These are key features that will be relevant when you bring securities transactions on a blockchain. Because as of now, we are only talking about payments and how banking is going to get disrupted. But like now the key aspect that can get disrupted is investment management and how investments are done, be it from the processing side, the, the operational side, and so forth. And smart contracts are relevant in that sense, but you don't need a smart contract. Like say for, in Ethereum, they call it smart contract. On the Stellar chain, they call it chain code. These are basically features that, that can come in handy for different securities transactions. Let's look at digital assets broadly now, categorization. So we have cryptocurrency, stable coins, Utility tokens, digital securities, and central bank issued digital currency. <laughs> uh, okay, now let's look at crypto. Uh, uh, any questions on this categorization? Do you feel that I should have a different categorization? Add, change? Any views here? All good? Happy with this? Okay. So let's move to the next one. Let's look at cryptocurrency. Okay, the first one out of the dock. So Bitcoin brought us blockchain, right? Um, so we, uh, as a world, the technology was discovered when this cryptocurrency was issued. So we have today regulators going, you know, cryptocurrency bad, blockchain good, right? And mm, it's, it makes sense. I understand why they say that, but uh, it may not be a holistic view on what, that anything, every blockchain has a digital asset. You can use it as a cryptocurrency, you can use it as a share, you can use it as a bond, you can use it every chain, every time a record transfer, the, that digital asset is what moves. That's what's between the two blocks that connects. So there's no blockchain without a, an asset, a, a digital asset, which, which is you know, a cryptocurrency or whatever you call it. Okay, let's go back to cryptocurrency. So Bitcoin, first one out of the dock. Key thing here, as of today, it's about 10,600 USD per coin, 17.9 million coins are in issuance, which gives it a market cap of around 191 billion. Um, apparently there are 50 million uh, Bitcoin wallets currently, um, out of which I think maybe 30% is active. Um, so that's 15 million wallets which are active. Uh, it doesn't mean the rest of the 35 million is not active. It, they, they could be just holding it. Because remember, there is a segment within the world's population who believes, they're called Bitcoin maximalists, who believe that they don't want to trade, they don't want to transact in fiat currencies. They don't believe in it. It might sound crazy to us because from the conventional world, but there is a significant percentage of the population who believe this. 
So they could be just buying to hoard. Um, so key thing that cryptocurrency did, enabled peer-to-peer -peer payments. Just like you wanted to book a, house, uh, a vacation home, you use Airbnb. You don't go book on Marriott, right? So it's a transaction between me and X, and Airbnb intermediated it, right? Or brought us together in the platform. Same with Uber. I want to get a ride. Uber as a platform enabled it. Here, I want to transfer value. I bought something from you, and I want to pay for it, right? I am able to transfer value directly to you and not use a bank not use a payment gateway, not use Visa, not use Western Union, nothing. My wallet to your wallet, press of a button, value transferred. That's it. That's all that cryptocurrency does. It can enable peer-to-peer -peer transactions without intermediaries, right? Who are the intermediaries now? Banks, payment gateways, you name it. The, the, the multitudes it changes, it knocks on their door. So why do regulators have an issue with cryptocurrency? It's point number four, privacy features or anonymity. Bitcoin as a cryptocurrency is, is pseudo-anonymous. It's not entirely anonymous, it's pseudo-anonymous. What it means is that if I have a wallet, okay, so this is, say, this is my wallet and I have coins in here. I have a hash, hash and a 29 letter combination of alphanumerics. And that's what identifies this wallet. Okay, now, there's no, my name's not there. My Emirates ID is not linked to this wallet, right? That, but, any transaction that happens on the Bitcoin blockchain between this wallet and another wallet and another wallet can be tracked, right? So every single transaction that happens on a public blockchain can be traced back. There is a document, I mean, there is a trail that there. But the issue is these wallets cannot be directly linked to a person unless they're on an exchange. So when I'm on a crypto exchange, I have to do KYC to get in there. So I get myself registered there. And then say, for example, from that wallet, I transfer it to this wallet. Then, I, you know, there are firms for this who specialize only on tracking this. Uh, then they will link my wallet to that wallet and then link all the transactions that happen, bang, you're on the hook. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Two things there again, right? One is the Bitcoin blockchain has never been hacked, right? It's, I don't want to say it's unhackable, but that's the idea of the technology, is to be unhackable. The Ethereum chain has not been hacked. What has been hacked are exchanges, people's wallets, storage places, okay? Two different things, two different things, not the same thing, okay? So when I go, say for example, you have, forget you, let's say X and Y, okay? X has 10, Bitcoins or whatever he's holding on Binance, okay? And Binance gets hacked, right? And somebody moves that coin out, okay? And takes it to their wallet. And most likely they'll split it into pieces, they'll change it into other coins, and then they will change it back into fiat. So that's the usual way how these hackers operate. To answer your question, can it be traced? Yeah, it can. It can be traced right till the end. But this is where the problem is. Monero or Zcash. Bitcoin, Ethereum, these can be tracked. Monero, Zcash, no. These are privacy coins. Right? You can't trace Monero. 
you can't track back Zcash. At least that's their whole USP. Their purpose of existence is to be a privacy coin. Okay, so if I have two wallets, okay, two wallets and I'm going to transfer from A to B and I transfer Monero, what happens is that in the Bitcoin blockchain, this transaction gets recorded from wallet A to wallet B. Okay, so you have the trail, Monero no, in the middle they'll blank it, so they'll cut the trail out. So it will go from A to B, but you can't track back. Zcash, same thing. These are privacy coins. And this is the biggest bone of contention for regulators. And this is what gives the entire industry, along with the ICO scams and all the rest of it, the bad name that the, the blockchain, digital asset, cryptocurrency, the whole industry has now been labeled with. Right? Why? Because Monero is known as cartel coin. Right? I don't know what Zcash's nickname is, but, you know, I mean, it says it all. Right? But look at the market cap. BTC market cap, 191 billion. Monero market cap, 1.5 billion. Total crypto market cap as of now is 287 billion. What's the percentage of it? Okay, one, two percent. How many billions were laundered through banks last year? How much fines have HSBC or uh, let, let me not say names, but you know how much how much fines have biggest banks in this uh, within the space have paid for being caught for money laundering or illegal transactions? So you want to paint the full industry black just because you have 2% of bad actors? I don't think it's fair. And I think that's what's going to change. Um, cryptocurrency, what is it for people? Why do people use it? Well, medium of exchange, transfer of value, speculative asset, most common, most common, everyone's in it, half the guys who, who who were punting in 2017, be it any crypto or ICOs, I don't think they really knew what they were doing. They knew how to operate a wallet, and that's about it. So that was speculation, right? And what is the future for cryptocurrency, or how do regulators look at it? Let's look at the first regulator who ran after cryptocurrency and investors who hold cryptocurrency. Who are they? The taxman. So the taxmen were the first, first to, to go after people who were investing in cryptocurrencies. Why? Because they wanted their chunk, you know, their share. Right? And how is cryptocurrency regarded from tax purposes? Very complicated. Because the the tax man waited till the financial uh, regulator came out and said, what is this? Is it a currency? Is it a commodity? Is it a, is, what is this? Right? Uh, we need time to figure this out. We don't know what it is because I cannot call it currency because the only, I, uh, as a country, there can only be one currency and that's mine. So what's this currency? Global currency? Nah, can't be. So financial regulators were very slow in, in, in trying to define this. So the tax authorities took it to themselves. So in various countries, this is, uh, can be, it's considered a commodity, it's considered a property, uh, it's considered an uh, asset, just any asset, like you have a painting. You buy, you sell, you make capital gains, pay me my share. That's all the tax man cares. Um, so that's from a tax point of view. Uh, from a financial regulator's point of view, Japan recognizes cryptocurrencies as a medium of exchange. They were the first to recognize it as a payment mechanism or a medium of exchange. Um, most other countries, so the regulatory approaches can be like siloed into three. One is where like people like Japan who say, okay, fine, you know, you want to use it for your payments, go ahead, I recognize it as a medium of exchange. Then you have the guys in the middle. When it comes to cryptocurrency, um, where they don't do much, 
they put out a note, say what they say is, we will recognize it as whatever, but they don't really go into the nuances of defining it and saying, okay, am I going to accept this as a medium of exchange? Is this some, is it a currency? No, no, no I don't, uh, at least to my knowledge, I don't think anyone has gone so far to recognize it like that. So that's why the regulators in the middle, you know, who, who want to see which direction the wind blows or somebody takes the lead, few guinea pigs in front, you know, let me learn from them and then let me get my regulations right. That's one approach. And then you have the third uh, set of regulators who just outright banned it. Crypto, no, banned. Okay. So, a couple of countries have done this, like where outright it's banned, you can't deal with crypto, boom. Um, can they implement that kind of ban? Yeah, within the country, if you want to come back and change it into fiat, I have 10 BTC, if BTC is banned in this country, I can't change it back to fiat. That's all you can do, but you cannot ban it. Because it's, who, what, what are you going to stop? These are millions of computers processing the Bitcoin ledger and processing the transaction and all I need is a wallet, right? So if you don't want to give me US dollars here in this country because, uh, I don't mean here, but you know what I mean, country X. I have a wallet, I'm in country X, it's banned in country X, so I cannot get the country's local currency. Yeah, so what? I take a flight, I go somewhere else, get it change it out, I get their currency. So what I mean is that you can't ban it. That's my point. It's the, you have to find ways to live with it, deal with it, regulate it, and bring it into the mainstream. But you can't fight it and close it. And that's not going to happen. I, mean, I, don't, I don't think it's possible. If you, beg, I mean, if you differ on that view, I'm, I'm interested to know that perspective. Okay, stable coins. Stable coins, cryptocurrencies are very volatile, right? We know that from uh, Bitcoin. That is, what, 2016, 600 pounds. 2018 Jan, it's, what, 18,000, 17,000 pounds? Yeah, $20,000. It's like, you know, what changed within one and a half years for it to have such a meteoric rise? It's speculative asset, hugely volatile. So stable coins come in to solve that volatility problem. Because if I want to use it as a medium of exchange, and if I'm transferring $10, I expect you to receive $10, not 9.5 or 12.2, right? Stable coins are just that, right? So they go, they live on the a, a, a conventional cryptocurrencies ecosystem, that is, they are a cryptocurrency, but the only difference is that this digital asset now is backed by fiat, right? So that means each, um, each say, USD coin issued by uh, Circle and Coinbase, uh, Circle is Goldman Sachs, uh, Goldman Sachs investment into uh, crypto space, and uh, Coinbase is by far one of the best interfaces, you exchanges you can find. It's amazing how the UX and the, I don't know why I'm marketing Coinbase now. <laughs> but anyway, uh, but I'm just saying for the ease of use, it's like, it's, it's really nice the interface. I, I haven't found a stockbroking system um, which has that kind of interface. And that's how cool that is. Um, so. Yeah, so what USD coin does is that for each digital asset that's issued, Circle and Coinbase through their uh, an SPV, special purpose vehicle, back it up with a dollar. So every time 10 USD coins are an issue, that's $10 backing it up. So I want to pay a dollar, I can use a stable coin now, and I pay you to your wallet. Now you have it. So unlike all the problems that were associated with cryptocurrency, that is the volatility where price constantly changes and you, have, you don't have certainty when you transmit value, stable coins are there to solve that. Another thing it does is that uh, within the crypto ecosystem, a lot of speculation, so buy, sell, trade, um, and people don't want to bring the money back into fiat. You know, you move it 
to crypto, start trading, make money or lose money, whichever. Uh, but you know, they want to stay in that ecosystem. They want to keep that capital within that ecosystem. Stable coins allow you to do that, right? Because say I hold 10 BTC, I feel BTC gonna go down and I can't be bothered to trade. I buy Tether and I park it there. And I sit tight until the next trade comes. So, you know, it helps you park money in a stable, uh, uh, yeah. Who supervises? Yeah, banking. US dollar, for example. Oh, uh, USD coin. Yes. Who, who, who are the auditors and uh, whatever. Yeah, this is an SEC approved uh, coin. So Tether has controversial. Uh, it's, it's controversial because they are backing, um, you know, twice they didn't uh, release their audited accounts in time. They had to move their banks from Taiwan to Hong Kong to now somewhere in the Caribbean. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so Tether had its drama. But this is an SEC approved coin. Circle and Coinbase are both SEC approved uh, market participants. So, um, and I, I don't know who their auditors are, but they have an appointed auditor. Same with Gemini Dollar. Pardon? It has a risk. A risk. What's the risk? Uh, yeah, I mean, the, 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 the risk of fraud exists everywhere, right? I mean, how do we know that, to answer this gentleman's question, hey, the central bank tells us they got money, how do you know? You believe them, right? So if this is approved, I mean, if these are SEC approved market participants, then you shift that question of trust to that regulator. Ask him. Yeah, so USD coin represents one dollar. That's it. You put ten dollars in this pocket, I issue ten USD coins. Now keep this back and this ten USD coins move. What's the benefit of moving uh, a USD coin as opposed to a US dollar? Well, if I want to move US dollars, I physically take the currency, run up to you, here you go, or give it to Fetcher, whichever, or go to a bank, go to Western Union, do some online transactions, have to do all of that. But if you have a USD coin, it's wallet to wallet, right? So that, that's, that's the disintermediation that happens. Right, and so stable coins take the properties of a cryptocurrency that is the ability to disintermediate and also eliminate the volatility side. Right now, because it's backed by a dollar, it you know, you idea you, you don't expect that thing to go. Have I answered your question? Kind of okay, can I do better? Pardon? I want to hold my money into this currency for a long period of time. Oh, okay. So, okay. So, you mean to say stablecoin is very useful if I want to transact, but if I want to store value, that it's not because it's backed by the US dollar and you have no faith in this fiat currency. Is that what, yeah, that's your personal view, mate. Right. I, I mean, if you've lost faith in US dollar, that means... Um, oh. Yeah, so the way the comfort is given is the fact that they are SEC regulated. And that's the best. Pardon? Sorry. I get paid interest by the bank on the dollar. I don't get interest paid to me if I hold it. Yeah, you don't. Yeah, so go to, um, go to players like, um, um, again, SEC approved banks. I mean, if, if you're talking in US dollars, you can go to, there are enough US banks now. I think, uh, I can't remember the name now, but uh, there is a bank which will pay you interest on your crypto holdings. 
yeah yeah they will pay you in crypto back there are crypto providers with whom you can park your BTC or any of your crypto assets usually it's BTC ETH or Stella and a few of those assets where they would actually pay you a return because uh, they do margin lending uh, they do lending against crypto um, today one of the US banks a, uh, um, a licensed regulated US bank um, authorized lending against crypto assets and I think that's the first for a bank to do so you can keep you can park your BTC and borrow from a bank borrow fiat from a bank so there were uh, crypto related market participants who are doing it but I think this was the first bank which is doing okay utility tokens big issue here this is where most of the mud that's being um, you know all the bad name for this industry comes from utility tokens and why because of the third point here crowdfunding that is people used utility tokens as a method of raising capital they raised capital as unregistered securities, unauthorized offerings, and so forth. And there were a lot of scams in this. And they were all done because as a utility token, you don't have to register with the securities regulator for your fundraise, right? Because it's a utility token. It, you're using it for a utility. It's not a security. So they use this, this, um, oh, it, so I, I don't even know how to call it. it it's like they were, I, I guess market participants assumed that they were circumnavigating regulations, but it just ended up causing a lot of harm to the industry when it shouldn't have because of the use utility tokens for crowdfunding. But leaving that aside, what is a utility token? Think about air miles, right? What can you do with your air miles? Can you buy perfume with your air miles? Can you buy your, 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 whatever you want to buy, you can. It's currency, it has value, right? It is a lot, you have smile points. Can I pay my bill with it? Yes, I can, right? If I can, if I have thousand uh, miles, which can buy me a sandwich, right? And you want to buy a sandwich, if, can I transfer that, those miles to you? as opposed to going online, filling forms, doing everything. If they were on a coin, on a chain, I can, right? You go to a mall and they give you loyalty points, right? If you want those loyalty points to be, oh, let's look at Dubai Mall. You get those voucher cards, right? Where you buy from MR, but you can use it in across all the shops, right? What if that was a coin on your wallet, right? Save paper cut a few less trees, and more importantly, I can transfer, right? Now, that's a key function of a utility coin. And why, when you issue that on a blockchain, the ability is that it, it gives you transferability, it gives you trust that there is no fraud involved because, it, you know, it disintegrates the, the, the whole process of the chain, well, the merits of it. Now, Another example of a utility coin is, let's look at Binance coin. Binance coin is a, Binance is a, I don't know whether it's still the largest, but maybe it's number one or number two globally as a cryptocurrency exchange. If you hold Binance coin, and if you trade on Binance exchange, because you hold the coin, your brokerage fees or your transaction fees are less. Right? If I don't have the coin in my wallet and still transact in Binance, I pay a little bit more. Right? And Binance as an exchange gives its coin holders a percentage of its profits or revenue or something like that. So there's a revenue share as well. That's what makes this, like people question whether it's a real utility coin because of this aspect because they give, you, give back some aspect of the rare revenue and that makes it a security, or it, that's the gray area there. But um, if one were to look at it purely from a utility point of view, that's the purpose. So utility tokens are great if it's air miles, loyalty points and all this, but moment it starts going into crowdfunding or 
this exchange tokens, then the when it comes to existing regulations and how they are accepted or just looking at it from a logical point of view, is this a security or is this a utility, the lines become blurred in the middle. That's not good because if you want to, you know, you need to operate within the regulation. So the utility token, that, that's the whole problem with that. People misused it. Digital security is my favorite. Uh, why? Because I believe a blockchain as a technology could enable different things within the securities industry. Number one, a private company can trade globally like a public company. How? I issue company excess share on the Stellar blockchain. Okay, someone from China, someone from San Francisco, someone from Sa Durban can buy this share now provided they satisfy local securities regulations and it's issued within that or you know subject to all that yeah. but now you can have a pub private company tradable or accessible to a global audience number one paradigm shift if i want to buy mr shares i have to go to dfm i need a brokerage account and then i buy only on dfm I want to buy company X now which issued on Stella and I'm sitting somewhere else. Hey, who cares? I don't need to come to and open a NIN number here and transact in DFM. No need. All I need is a wallet. So this, when executed right, that is where you can take a private company and make it accessible to a global capital pool is, I think the potential is phenomenal there. Let's look at private companies, okay? Let's look at the largest private companies available or the smaller startups, but private, okay? If I want to transact in their shares, how do I do that? I'll have to go to the company's house, change the shares, all that, okay? Now just imagine this company has its share tradable on a digital security, right? Suddenly, this private company's shares can be transacted, can be transferred between eligible market participants with much ease. And this is the transformative ability of blockchain when it comes to the private marketplaces. Okay, let's look at art or let's look at music royalties. Any of these illiquid assets which, you know, are not easily transferable. Do I need to call my private banker to figure out how I should buy a piece of art somewhere? Why pay the fees there? Might as well tokenize it and fractionalize the ownership, uh, you know. But, you know, that's what it does. It, 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 it disintermediates those processes. Uh, the other thing that it can do is fractional ownership, that is, Let's look at building X, 50 story, beautiful tower, prime location. I like a piece of it. I can't afford the whole thing, but I like a piece of it. Okay, take it, put it in an SPV, right? And now the SPV shares are issued on a stellar blockchain as, as a security. Now this real estate can be owned not by one, two, three, or people who have written, it will be owned by the shareholders of this SPV. And if all I could afford is $100, then that's how much I would buy. But if you could put in a million, then you would as well. But now, large high value asset ownership can be fractionalized and spread across, number one. Number two, illiquid assets can be made. You can create, I'm not saying just because you an asset, a private company can be tradable, it will, be, it will become liquid and private markets will have this sudden outpouring of liquidity into it. No, it doesn't work like that. But my, all I'm saying is that first, put in the rails. These are the rails. Will the train stop there? Make it worth its while. You have a good company and it's private and it's worth trading and it's worth investing in. Now it's made easier by a digital security. Right? If it's crap, no one's going to buy anyway. So, 
these are rails which enable things. These are rails which facilitate, which ease the process. And that is its transformative ability. Sorry. Sorry. Um, so, I just want to bring back a little bit back to the crowdfunding aspect of what you're talking about uh, utility token versus the digital security. Um, the ICOs, you said a lot of projects were bad projects and people were doing. Uh, no, those are not my words. Okay, okay. Yeah. So, I wanted to, to look at what is now the new version of the ICO, the IEO. Um, initial exchange operator, where now the project goes to the um, maybe say Binance, which is the crypto exchange, then the crypto exchange will verify the project, then it will issue its coin on there, and then that's how they can raise funds. Is that not uh, a bit better now? Doesn't that mean that fair finance is not regulated by the SEC, but it is, it has some form of regulation? Okay, so, sorry. So I just want to touch on that. Um, so we're actually doing a equity raise through uh, the SDO, so the security token offering. We're using a company called uh, tokenmarket.com. And uh, they've just gone through the S, uh, FCA sandbox system of doing their own token offering. Um, so I've purchased a few of that. You basically have a whole lot of portfolio to go. And uh, they actually do the uh, background checks, white paper, or they exist on their uh, on their marketplace for people to invest in uh, privately. So. Um, okay, just to touch on touch back on that question. You asked if IEO is legal. Well, I know it's not. Legal. Yeah, so I I've been in. Investment manager in the conventional world, managing equities, institutional equities, bonds, this kind of thing. So my mindset is from there. Um, I think it's illegal. I wouldn't touch it with the barge pole, right? Uh, simply because if you are doing a securities offering, right, there are established securities laws, right? Follow the steps come become a legal issuer, issue it to the world, right? The technology is only an enabler, right? Doing an IEO is a backdoor entrance to doing an ICO. You want to play that market, I mean, I, there's nothing wrong with that, but that's not within the regulated world. And here, sit standing on this regulator's podium, hey, all hail regulation, okay? <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. But I, I agree with you, I agree with you. Yeah. Uh, but then, still, I mean, Binance, who regulates Binance? Binance is not, regu it's not entirely regulated as an exchange. If Binance was regulated, they wouldn't be, you know, jumping ship from uh, their bank account from Malta to to um, a Caribbean island to back to Malta or trying to split their licenses one in Africa one in Uganda one in Malta one in Singapore why if I'm legal stand strong stay hold your head high say come check me out right you can't do that I means something's wrong isn't it right you've got nothing to hide open your books the same for Tether right open their books they're not opening it right there's a problem and this is no good because these things hamper industry growth and these things bring bad name to good actors and but yin and yang we just need to learn to live with it and you know navigate um, let me rush up on this so that I can finish this. Um, I left this for this last, but this could be a blockbuster, right? <laughs> Why? It's a central bank issued digital currency. What does this mean? Okay, I am central bank of country X. I decide, okay, currently I have in my money circulation M1, M2, M3, M4, I've counted everything. Okay, bang on currency circulation. I say 20% of my currency now, I'm going to issue it as a digital currency. Okay, 
Now, just imagine. <laughs> I keep saying imagine, imagine, but that's because it's not there yet, yeah? So don't get me wrong. Um, just imagine a situation where you keep your cash, your excess savings, in a bank account. Why? Because you don't want to keep it under the mattress. It's too cumbersome in a safe, right? Bank is much better, right? Now, central bank issues the digital currency, gives you the wallet, right? Do I need a bank? I might need a bank to get a car loan, but I don't need a bank to keep my savings account or my current account. Because now I have the currency in my wallet and I can deal with every single one person using my local currency. That is a central bank digital currency. There are 40 plus projects which are currently being explored. Why? Because that's how a proactive regulator or rather tries to assimilate how this emergent technology can impact. Do you want to have the regulator finding themselves one fine day, waking up, hey, I cannot control my monetary policy, my banks, my, my M1, M2, everything's just going bonkers here. What do I do? Right? So you anticipate and you prepare. And out of these 40 plus projects, the Thai Central Bank projects in Tanon, Swedish, e krona uh, but I think you need to, pardon? No, 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 no one has issued yet. Yeah, so that's why just imagine. Yeah, 40 plus countries are exploring this project. So will China lead the way? Why did I put China there? Because PBOC, People's Bank of China, is one of the leading players or, or, or participants who are exploring this very vigorously. And, and um, if what I've read can be believed, I think they're in testing phase, they're in beta phase. Uh, not that they want to issue it, but be because they want to be ready with it, if they have to. And why is this relevant? If a country imposes a sanction on another country, okay, 86% of the global trade is in US dollars. Okay, so if I'm going to say I'm going to sanction country X and I close off the SWIFT, okay, I cannot transact with that country. Why? With a simple switch, you, you close SWIFT for me. And 86% of the global trade is happening in one dominant currency, so tough luck. But what happens if I can transact in my own currency directly with whom I want to, irrespective of what your relationship is with them. Think about it. That's why this is relevant. So, moments, so the more pressure we put through global, you know, global different pressures are now we can feel that, you know, different talk about headlines, this war, that war, trade war, sanctions, eh, hmm. you want to circumnavigate all that, look into technology, see if that can solve the problem. And one of the ways, China is 15% of global GDP, US is 23%, between them they account for 40% of global GDP. But I'm 15% of global GDP, why do I have to trade in your currency? Maybe I should trade in mine. If you want to sell to me, I'm 15% of global GDP, come trade in my currency. So I have an oil derivatives exchange now, Shanghai oil derivatives exchange. I don't need to trade oil in you dollar. I have a commodities exchange. All I need is a currency that circumnavigates SWIFT. What happens then? These are just possibilities, but what I'm saying is, uh, is to highlight the ability of the technology and what it can do, and how it can solve certain problems. Uh, this ecosystem has developed just like our own conventional markets. We have the full, now since 2013, the crypto market has, or this blockchain, this industry has grown to such an extent that uh, I think there's more than $24 billion as of to date 
investments which has gone into it, nothing much. Uh, but a lot of it is people putting their own, working on their own, and we've got this full ecosystem working here. Um, um, okay, I wanted to go a bit into digital banking and connect that with this and how it's involved, but I think my time is up. Um, so like a quick wrap up so that I can open the house for questions. Um, me personally, I started off somewhere in, in 15, late six, early 16. In this, I liked it coming from the conventional industry, the ability to be a bit rebellious, to push the envelope here and there, to see how, you know, how far you can go. But um, I actually realized that there's quite a bit of good, nice business opportunity in the whole spectrum. And um, what I've told you, um, and what I spoke about earlier, um, not so much theoretical knowledge, this is my personal experience with, in the last three years, operating within this, uh, within, oh, interacting within this industry. And uh, in my view, I believe that blockchain as a technology would have transformative effect on, impact on financial services, especially banks, on the pay, so in the banks, the low hanging fruit are payments, retail banking low-hanging fruit. 30% for an average size bank's income is payments-based fee income. It can hit it hard with crypto. can hit it hard if you get it right. Right? So that's can do. On the other side, CASA, uh, current account, savings accounts. That's the other aspect where this technology can go into. On investments, disintermediating um, I mean, you will change the role of depositories. Depositories will have to change how they operate. Settlement mechanisms will change. Uh, this means some of the custodian, um, I don't like paying custodian fees. Uh, that's just me personally as an investment manager because I just think that they eat off my investment income. But irrespective of that, uh, I feel bringing in blockchain technology into custodian, uh, be it conventional or uh, the crypto space, can significantly shrink their cost. Significantly shrink the cost there. Uh, do we need them? Yeah, we'll still need them. They, that's how the system, unless someone can think of another way that you can eliminate all these intermediaries altogether, but I don't think so. So as of now, if you look at the securities regulations, these intermediaries will exist, but they will have to transform some of their services, and some of their services will become irrelevant. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Um, I was actually hoping to hear a little bit more about um, the regulation part in particular. It says that looking at local regulations like the FSA and uh, the ATGP or and what the SEC is now saying about the difference in where we are now. Um, regulations here locally. Okay, so ADGM has issued its crypto regulations. It can be downloaded from their sites. Um, it came out in 2018, and now they have done an update in 2019. Quite elaborate and descriptive in terms of what they. I think it's um, it's it's a regulation, so I think it's best for one to read it, as for me to say it, but uh, so that they've been progressive that way. Um, I don't know about the other two regulators here. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, there's the toys here. Yeah. Um, Yeah, so Bitoasis has now received the in-principle license from ADGM. Uh, they did operate for a few years, I guess, uh, under more opaque terms. Uh, but I, I don't know. I mean, about Bitoasis, it's best asked from Bitoasis. I, I don't know about that. Yeah. No, three people. Yeah, three. In, uh, to my knowledge, three, in, three to four in principle licenses have been issued by 
uh, ADGM for crypto exchanges. Yeah, you don't need exchange at all. It's peer to peer. So what's the point of an exchange? A liquidity pool. It brings market participants together. So I want to transfer to him. I can with my peer. But if I want to have price discovery, I need to have demand and supply. I need to have large number of buyers and large number of sellers so that the mechanism of price discovery is accurate. An exchange enables this. Uh, well, a provider of a, of a wallet can be an exchange. Exchanges can provide you broadly two or even three types of wallet. So that's your hot wallet, your cold, your semi-hot, uh, uh, semi-cold wallet, and your cold wallet. Okay, hot wallet is where you have on the main screen on the exchange hackable. Next level, exchange keeps it, but in their cold uh, hot wallet, in the middle, one line more of defense, right? Cold storage, out, out of the ledger, I mean, um, out of the exchange, unhackable. I mean, unhackable in the sense, unless you give your private key, then... Yeah, then you get facilitated. But, so in this case, I'm talking the wallet with the exchange, I can have my own private wallet, and I use it in the um, no, if you want to trade on the exchange, it's best that, I mean, more often, unless you are, okay, let's look at two, exchanges can be two forms, decentralized exchange, centralized exchange, Coinbase, centralized exchange, okay, Coinbase is the master of the show, you want to trade on Coinbase, you need to be on their hot wallet, okay, but you go decentralized exchange, okay, they are more flexible. You can transact, I mean, you can go via, I mean, they'll just enable you, but you will do peer-to-peer. -peer. They'll just be like a, like a screen that comes to matchmake, but they don't take it from you, and they don't do like a stock exchange does. They just, they just, they're just a screen, so like Stella X or something. You know, it's a decentralized thing. You can see the market, you can see the depth and the offers, or you can interact with another market participant, but you don't need to transfer it to the wallet and do it out. So that's a completely decentralized ecosystem that you would operate in.